Good morning. My name is Wayne Hanna, and I'm your treasurer this year and a member of the Board of Trustees. And on behalf of the Board, I want to welcome everyone this morning and give a special welcome to visitors and any new members. So the mission of North Shore Unitarian Church is to empower people to live with greater depth, meaning, and purpose. We are an inclusive community. We welcome people of all genders, all sexual orientations, all socioeconomic backgrounds, all beliefs. We welcome you because we want your whole self and your varied experience. We understand that this will make our community stronger, wiser, and more whole. <clears throat> when we come to church each week, each time, we bring with us a story of how we chose to be a member of this community. For me, one of the most important parts of being a member is that we exist only because we are all willing to support this community. Our community involves a lot of volunteer time, but it also involves supporting paid staff as well as maintaining these facilities. On one hand, we do not have a big organization that can financially help us if we get into difficulty. On the other hand, they don't tell us what to do either. I like that independence. But we can only be this community if we all support it, with both our time and our financial resources. If you're visiting us today, we welcome you to learn more about us one of our greeters, any of the board members, or of course, either of our co-ministers would be pleased to talk with you and answer any questions you may have. Welcome to everyone, and we look forward to you joining us for coffee. Our holiday dinner that's coming up on December 9th. The tickets are now available, and you can find Diane Hicks, who will be selling those tickets, or you can get them from Janny in the office of another day. And um, lastly, next Sunday is the Children's Gift Making Workshop, which is um, organized by Lynn Sabrin, our Director of Religious Education. And this is one example of one of the really neat um, gifts that can be made. They're for um, kids five and up. Um, this is cookies in a jar. And what she's asked is if anyone has jars this size, which is like a quart size, if you could donate them, that would be much appreciated. Or um, the next size down, which is sort of like pasta, pasta sauce jar size, um, that would be much appreciated. So um, anyway, welcome everyone. We're glad you're here. Well, good morning, everyone. And just just to be clear, that's Sonny Wachowski, and I'm Bruce Grierson, just so, so you're clear from um, what it says in the program. So on, on Wednesdays, I like to uh, skip out of sleepy Lynn Valley and go downtown and sort of plug into the energy of the city. And there's a cafe on Pender Street that I like to work in. I set up sort of by the window. I have my little spot. And that's where I was on a day about five weeks ago. And it was a spectacular day, and so they had thrown the windows open, and a kind of a warm breeze was wafting in, and, and I was sitting there, I was working away, I was having a great, great working day. And I actually said to my, I remember saying to myself, I'm having a great working day. And, and then, as I'm typing away, I noticed something kind of in the corner of my eye. And it was a guy on a bicycle riding down the sidewalk, in, coming toward, sort of coming toward the window, and he was steering with one hand, and as he passed right in front of me, with the other hand, he reached through the window, and he grabbed my laptop by the screen, and in one sort of deft motion, plucked it right off of the counter and slipped it into a messenger bag and kept riding. Well, I said a salty word very loudly. It, people, ju people jumped out of their skin in that cafe how loudly I said that word. And then I started running after him. I ran out of the cafe, and, and I started 
taking off down the street. Now, the sight of a kind of middle-aged, bald guy just giving her down a street and a, and a crowded, uh, in a crowded downtown is pretty surprising. And a lot of people kind of um, looked, and, and I was shouting, stop that guy! He's got my laptop! Stop him! And some people actually did try to help. Uh, one guy in particular, a guy in a business suit, made a lunge for him, missed him. He sort of juked around the guy, and, uh, and then he turned down Homer, and, and I saw him sort of disappear, and I, and, and I knew I wasn't going to catch him. And I stopped running, and I just caught my breath. And I thought, that's it. But it wasn't it, because two seconds later, this Toyota Camry sort of squeals into the curb, and the driver says, get in. I saw everything. We're going to catch this guy. So I got in, and off we roar down, down Pender. And at this point, I'm thinking, hmm, now this is a bit of a leap of faith. It could be that this guy is, is as much of a shyster as the last guy, and he's in cahoots with that guy, and now we've moved from, you know, robbery to kidnapping. But I'm all in at this point. <laughs> And so off we go, and the plan is to sort of get in front of this guy. Uh, he's clearly heading to the downtown east side to try to fence this computer at one of the open-air markets there before it's even had time to cool. So we're going to get in front of him, come back, intercept him before he, uh, before he makes it there. But this thief uh, has clearly done this before because when we get to where he should be, he's not there, and he's, he's given us the slip. And what happens over the next hour is a series of hopes that are raised and then dashed. So it was like someone says, there's got to be a, um, a surveillance camera in that cafe. And there is, but he was moving too fast. He was just a blur. What about that app, Find Your Computer? I have it. It wasn't on. So the short of it all is, I lost that computer. Never got it back. There were 545,000 files in it. Uh, it was one of those, like a loaf of sourdough bread that's contained every other loaf of sourdough bread you've ever eaten. I, I put everything, basically everything I've ever thought was worthwhile recording in my whole life was in that computer. So, and some of it's recoverable, and it looks like some of it isn't. So, I was pretty bummed out after that. And the next few days were... Um, I, I, got a little bit, I got a little bit depressed, and I got a little bit down on human nature itself. And I thought, man, people, people will disappoint you. Eh? People will rip your heart out sometimes. And somebody heard me talking like that, and they said, wait a minute, wait a minute. That's my species you're talking about here. And they said, from what I've heard, as you tell me the story, there's, there's one bad guy in this story, and he, you know, even he's probably not a bad guy, just a desperate guy, right? But there are at least five good guys in women. You know, that guy who, the guy in the, the Good Samaritan in the Camry, the guy in the business suit who tried to make a lunch for the guy, the person who phoned the cops as soon as he saw this happen, the cops themselves who investigated, the guy who stayed behind in that cafe and waited for me to show up an hour later guarding my stuff, including my cell phone, which had fallen out of my pocket when I ran out of there. The person who, when they heard about it, lent you their laptop. The other person who flat out gave you their laptop. She so said, one bad thing happened to you, right? But then angels fell from the sky. And that is why I come to church. I need sometimes to be reminded about all the angels that are falling from the sky, and I need perspective on what I should be paying attention to out there. You know, I lost a thing, and it was an important thing, but it was just a thing. And what I found is that when you lose a thing, people rush in to fill the vacuum, and somehow you end up farther ahead than if you hadn't lost the thing in the first place. It's like the Japanese saying, my barn burned down, and now I can see the moon. Thank you. There's going to be a canvas celebration this year on this coming Friday, on uh, November the 17th. All are invited. It's a potluck, so please bring an appetizer or a, a dessert and your favorite alcoholic beverage. The church will be providing a non-alcoholic punch. And Carrie and friends will be, pro will be providing some entertainment 
starting at 9, because uh, it starts at 7 p.m. I should have mentioned that. So there'll be two hours for conversation without having to compete with any music. But at 9 o'clock, we're going to have some original tunes, and Carrie's also promised some, some dance tunes, uh, group dancing. And do it in a chair. Can do it in a chair. For those of us that like to take it easy. <laughs> so hope to see you there. All are welcome. And now we're going to have the dynamic duo of Jell and Rebecca, who are new members of our church. They joined last June, uh, and uh, they're going to do the Canvas testimonial. Please come on up. Before we get started, actually, I have to tell you a story. I was having a great day on my bike the other day. Just I said to myself, it was a perfect day on my bike, and this, this guy. <laughs> anyway. Sorry. He was down there saying, should I say it? Should I not say it? Should I say it? <laughs> okay, so good morning. Good morning. Uh, I'm Rebecca Lindley. I'm Joe Coward. Uh, and we were asked to do the canvas testimonial this morning. So we're a new family to the church. Uh, we have a 14-year-old daughter, Maisie, uh, and a nearly 12-year-old son, Lowell. Lowell's the one who often wears a tie, but with very messy hair. And, and rubber boots. Yeah. <laughs> So um, Maisie is a member of, of youth group. You, you might have met her downstairs at coffee. If, if you haven't been downstairs for coffee after the service, please, please do come down. Uh, and she's, over the last year, she's been away to Canoodle and she's been away to Goldmine and it's been a great thing in her life. And Lowell is part of the older RE class. Um, and he reminds us regularly that he met his best friend, Matteo, here at church. Yeah, I've lost where we are now. <laughs> so yeah, so it's just over a year since we, uh, since we joined this church. And, uh, in fact, I have to say, I've never been a member of, of any church, and actually from my background, it was very unlikely that I would ever be a, a member of, of any church, but, uh, but here I am. Uh, and I grew up in the United Church. Good uh, two-shoes. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, uh, and then as a young adult, I shifted to the community um, in Thunder Bay, where I was living at the time, to the UU community there. But we, our family actually, since moving to BC, hasn't been part of a church community until we came here last year. Uh, actually, so, um, and Marcus, Marcus reminded me not long ago that our first church service was their first service last September, um, except you probably all noticed them, didn't really notice us. <laughs> so a bit of trivia about us. We, uh, we, we live in a house in, uh, in Lim Valley now with our family, which we share with uh, four wild mice who, uh, who we feed and play with and, and talk to, uh, to, to every day. And uh, you might want to ask us about it. It involves a 1970s camper van and uh, brings great joy to our life, actually. It does. They're fun to play with and interact with. They're better than television, better than Netflix. Net, net what? Yeah, net, net what. what? Um, so why do we come to church? Why are we very happy to be, very grateful to be part of this beautiful community? And we were, we were finding it tricky to find words to express that, something that we know and feel in our soul, but to find the right, right words to say was, was difficult. So we were... We were sat at the table talking about this, actually being hassled by our son to get on and play a game of Clue with him, and uh, he wanted to move things along. So we said to him, you know, we need to find words to talk about this, and, uh, you know, what do you think we should say? And, and quick as a flash, he came up with these three things in, in this order. Well, it's great to be part of a faith-based congregation. <laughs> <laughs> right. And we get to know people in ways that otherwise we wouldn't. And then he paused, and he thought for a minute, and there's delicious soup on Sundays. <laughs> So thanks, we're done, and, and thanks to the great RE program, you've moved Lowell to a great place. And <laughs> we should probably say a little bit of our own thoughts. So we, we We've only got 35 minutes. Yeah, right? Is okay. that right? Is that right? Yeah. <laughs> um, we're on to page two, don't worry. Um, we moved here just over a year ago from a very small community and moved to the thriving metropolis of the North Shore. And we didn't really know anyone locally when we arrived. And within a month of coming here in September, we had started to make some connections. And I think most importantly for us, our children were making connections. Um, and there were a group of adults that knew our children's names. And as our, our children adapted to being, uh, being thrown really into the, the bigger fish ponds of larger schools than they'd ever been used to, um, here they, they, they had and they have uh, a community that is, that is separate from school and a, an intergenerational and supportive community that's separate from school. And, uh, and we're very grateful for that. This place is a place of action. And it's a place of social accountability. And it's a great place of self-discovery. Last fall was a challenging time of transition for our family. And this place and the people and the programs and the connections and, and those things help carry us through those days. In this community, we find peace, we find acceptance, we find inspiration, motivation, uh, connection and inclusion, both for us as individuals and for us as a family. And for all of that, we're just deeply grateful. 
Hello, everyone, again. Is there, am I still on? Oh, now I'm learning how to hold this thing. Very good. We like that. Okay, so there was once a young anthropology student. Let's call him Brian. And Brian was in a bit of a pickle because he had a big assignment coming due. It was sort of one question for all the marbles in this course. And it was a diabolically simple sounding but really tough question. And the question was, tell a story to somebody 10,000 years in the future. So Brian's thinking a lot of variables there, right? What is, what is our medium of storage going to be? What's going to last for 10,000 years? And then what language do you, do you tell it in? What are we going to be speaking 10,000 years? Maybe, maybe we'll have figured out how to communicate telepathically by then, you know? Maybe we'll be squirting goo like those creatures in Arrival. He, he, you know, you just don't know. And so he was, he, was, he was trying to crack this nut. And the days were ticking down until this thing was due. And he kept walking by his professor's door, and there was a basket there where other people had submitted their, uh, their projects. And he peeked in there to see what some other people were coming up with here. And one guy had left an enormous uh, cement block with some symbols spray painted on it. And he's thinking, no, no, that, that cement's going to crumble and the paint's not even going to last 20 years. That's a non-starter. Somebody else he noticed had put their story on a little thumb drive and left that in there. And he's thinking, I don't think so. That's not going to work either. But the problem was he had nothing better himself. And so uh, finally the day came that the project was due and he went to his professor's door. He was going to ask for an extension. He figured he'd buy a couple more days and he'll come up with something. But he went there and, and the door was locked. And he looked at his watch and it was 4.05 and the office hours ended at 4. And he had blown it. And he hung his head and he thought, I, I guess that's it. And he started to walk away. And then he got an idea. It was a bit of a Hail Mary. He took off his hat. And then he took out a, a piece of paper and he wrote a note to tuck inside the hat. And the note said, Dear Professor McGillicuddy, this is my hat. It has been my boon companion for 20 years over four continents. It saved me from sunstroke at a bullfight in Barcelona. And I use it to whack dead a, a, a cockroach in the desert of New Mexico. And one time, I bartered it for a chicken dinner when I totally ran out of dough in Athens, and then I bought it back again. It's been sat on on the bus, and it's been pooped on by birds, and it's been gnawed on by a golden retriever. Yet here it still is, part of my life, protecting my prematurely balding head. Now that you know the story of my hat, Please tell it to somebody else. And he took that note, and he jammed it into the hat band, and he hung it on the doorknob of that professor's door. And then he started walking away, and his heart just sank because he thought, what in the world did I just do? What kind of crazy idea was that? And he started to catastrophize, and he thought, well, that's it. I failed this course, probably won't even get into grad school now. And then he imagined all the way down the line until he's getting cared for by the state. You know, he's just like, <laughs> like a bad, bad news. And, and he, got, he got so down on himself that he didn't even have the guts to go to the final class where the marks were given out. And because he didn't go to that class, he missed the scene that unfolded on that day. So the professor walked up and down the, the halls, the, the aisles, and the students were nervous, and they didn't even meet his gaze. And finally, without saying a word, he went over to his desk, and he opened the drawer, and he took out a hat, and he said, this is a student's hat. It has been his boon companion for 20 years over four continents. It saved him from sunstroke at a bullfight in Barcelona. And he used it to crush dead a scorpion in the desert in New Mexico. And one time, he bartered it for dinner in Greece when he'd run out of money, and, and, and later he, he bought it back. It's been pooped on, and sat on, and gnawed on, and yet here it still is an important part of his life. 
protecting his prematurely balding head. And today, I would like to add a new chapter to the story of this hat. This hat just earned its owner the only A I'm giving out in this class. <laughs> because he alone understood that there's only one technology powerful enough to, sit, to send our stories into a future we will never live to see. And that is the oral tradition. Two people talking across the primitive fire. I tell you a story, then you turn around and you tell it to somebody else, but with interest. You tailor it exactly for who you know them to be. And then they tell somebody else, but they give it a quarter turn too, because they know who that person is. And down the line it goes, person after person, until 10,000 years from now, someone hears that same story, and they slap their knee and they go, ha! The professor says, now that you know the story of this hat, go tell it to someone else. All right. Now, is this one working? Oh, good. Okay. So story making. Story making. This, this is what we do as a species. We seem to be wired to try to connect the dots of everything we see and hear and to make a narrative out of all of it that explains things. Stories are the reason that there are banks and countries and corporations and religions and schools and stock exchanges and museums and lemonade stands. Now, it makes sense evolutionarily why we might be wired to make stories. Right? People remember things better when you wrap the information in a story. So we can pass along our culture like that in installments. That's why stories go viral, the good ones. But here's the thing. The best stories don't just go viral outside of us, like that hat story. They go viral inside of us. You know, one minute we're listening to a story thinking, hmm, that's kind of interesting. And then we're going, wait, what? Holy dynamite, really? That's crazy. That cannot stand. What can I do? I've got to tell someone. And next thing you know, we're out of our chair and we're putting our jacket on. It's like we just got turned into a verb. We got activated. We thought it was a story we were hearing, but it turned out to be our marching orders. So here's an example of how this works. There's a gentleman named Ray Anderson, a businessman from Georgia who was CEO of a carpet company called Interface. And these guys were, and I think they actually may still be, the world's largest carpet manufacturer. Now, this is the early 1990s when this story takes place. And environmentalism is just starting to become a big deal. But not at Interface, not yet. Interface is a bit of a dinosaur. They produce an enormous amount of carpeting that ends up in landfills. They create whole lagoons of petroleum-filled waste. And some of the company's shareholders have begun asking questions. What's your green vision, Interface? Interface is, and, and Ray Anderson, has no answer for that because the truth is there is no green vision. We comply with the law, that's it. We stay within a millimeter of this, of this side of the law, and that's, that's it. So Ray is in a tricky spot this particular evening because he's supposed to deliver the next day a speech to shareholders explaining his company's environmental stance that doesn't exist. So he's sitting in his study in front of his keyboard try to, trying to square this up. He's trying to say something without really having anything to say, and he's totally skating. And his wife across the room can see this. She can see the stress in him as he's trying to make this work. And she, says, she comes over and she says, here, read this. Maybe there's something here that will, will inspire you. And she plunks on his desk a copy of a book. It's The Ecology of Commerce by Paul Hawken. So Ray opens the book, and he opens it by chance to a story. It's the story of a tiny remote island in northern Alaska called St. Matthew's Island. Nothing up there but a government research station and a whole lot of reindeer. The reindeer were introduced to the island in 1944, two dozen reindeer. But because they had no natural predators, their population went bananas. And soon there were 1,000 reindeer, then 2,000, 3,000. And when the race research station closed in the 60s and all the people left the island, there were 6,000 reindeer. So what happened next was someone came back to the island 10 years later to check on things and they found a wasteland, a ghost island, totally stripped of vegetation and the reindeer all dead. 
The land couldn't sustain them and they starved. That island, Paul Hawkins suggested, is Earth. And the reindeer are us. We're running amok, ripping through our resources faster than they can be renewed. God help us. So here's Ray Anderson reading this. He's sitting in his comfy den in Atlanta reading this passage, and it hits him, and I'll never forget how he puts this, it hits him like a burning spear through the chest. And the following evening, when he gets up in front of those shareholders, without a script, he says, folks, the way we run this company is unconscionable. People like me should be in prison. He pledges a total overhaul. Interface is going to buy back all the used carpet tiles it sold and recycle them. The goal is zero waste. And sure enough, within a year, the company has cut its environmental impact by a third. And a writer for Fast Company magazine says of Ray Anderson, mark my words, this guy is going to be one of those people of whom you say he changed the world. Now, I know the details of this story because that's how Ray told them to me. I was interviewing him for an article for Adbusters magazine, and as he told me about this conversion moment of his in his, in his southern drawl over the primitive fire of a landline circa 2001, I had my own version of a spear through the chest. I thought, oh my gosh, there's a book, there's a book here. I even had a title, U-Turn, subtitle, what if you woke up, woke up one morning and realized you're living the wrong life? People get lost, and then they find their way in a blaze of mission, and Ray Anderson is my poster boy. And so in a big flurry of enthusiasm, I dashed off a proposal to the Banff Center. They have a writer's colony there, and I figured if I could get in, I could whip this thing into publishable form. So just to be clear of the chain of events here, Ray's story of hearing Paul's story is now my story, and on it goes to Banff. And Banff goes dark on me crickets. I hear nothing. The deadline for the Writers' Colony submissions comes and goes, and I'm thinking, okay, well, I, I guess it was just really competitive. At least I tried, right? But too bad, damn it, because I thought I had a killer proposal here. Bummer. So just, just for fun, I call the BAMP Center up. Just want to be sure there wasn't some sort of miscommunication. And I ask for the coordinator I've been dealing with, a woman named Monica. And I'm told she no longer works there. Who am I speaking to? She says, it's Bruce Grierson. Oh, she says, you're the guy who submitted, what if you woke up one morning and realized you're living the wrong life? And I said, yeah, I, I'm, that, I'm that guy. She says, yeah, well, I'm sorry we didn't get back to you. Things are in a bit of disarray here. You see, Monica, she, uh, she read your proposal and she quit. <laughs> she, she quit to pursue her dream of being a writer. Thanks a lot. <laughs> so that's how stories work. When I say that stories go viral inside of us, what I mean is they sort of force us to look up at the shot clock, the shot clock of our lives. It's like, oop, I'm holding the ball, and I have five seconds to get rid of it. Shoot it, pass it, whatever. Do something. Just don't do nothing, because time's a ticking. One way or the other, you're going to make a difference in this game right now. Will it be for the better, or will it be for the worse? There was an amazing story in the New York Times about a month ago about Dr. Thomas Andrew, the longtime chief coroner of the state of New Hampshire. And by the, by the way, I was, I was hoping to uh, end here with a, with a more upbeat story than this one, but it's a, it's a good one, and I think you'll appreciate it. So in New Hampshire, the morgue is full, just like it is here in Vancouver. The morgue is full because the opioid crisis is killing people faster than the morgue can handle them. So this guy, Dr. Thomas Andrew, he comes to work every day, and his inbox is one young corpse after another on his examination table. Now, if you're a coroner, you have to detach yourself from what you're actually doing just for your own sanity. You're working on inanimate things. You have to think that way. But Dr. Andrew found he couldn't think that way. He couldn't stop thinking of these kids as kids. Their lives, their choices, their bad luck. They were sitting ducks, and they didn't even know it. They woke up one day with plans, not knowing it was their last day on Earth. And so, for Dr. Andrew, the weight of all those individual stories 
finally just becomes too much, and he snaps. He quits his job, and he makes a public statement. After seeing thousands of sudden, unexpected, violent deaths, I have found it impossible not to ponder the spiritual dimension of these events for both the deceased and especially for those left behind. He announces he's decided to pursue a divinity degree. His new life plan is to minister to young people to help them stay off drugs. That way, instead of just surveying the damage downstream, maybe he can do some good upstream. He announces he's applied to serve as a chaplain for the Boy Scouts of America. And here's my favorite quote from that story. The reporter is pumping for why. Why did you quit? Please explain. And Dr. Andrew replies, well, after a while, one is bound to ask, what is it all about? And I would say that that's why we're all here this morning, just to bring this thing full circle. Every one of us, whatever our circumstances, whatever our quest, whatever our view of the divine, we raise that question in our own minds. After a while, we are bound to ask, what is this all about? After a while, we are bound to ask, what's the story here? And how do I fit into it? Thank you.